Hello students, as you might know, we're working now quickly towards the French Revolution. But before we understand the French Revolution, we have to understand the Enlightenment. And before we understand the Enlightenment, we have to understand the Scientific Revolution. The Enlightenment doesn't quite make sense unless you understand the Scientific Revolution that went before it. Now, the Scientific Revolution basically begins in the 16th century, the 1500s. So yes, unfortunately, one more time, we have to go all the way back to the 1500s to understand what we're doing. So let's go back there right now. And actually, let's go back even further, because before we go to the 1500s, you have to understand what people thought before. Before the 1500s, the only way you had of observing the natural universe was basically the naked eye. And when you just have the naked eye, there's a few things that seem to be true, a few appearances that show up. First of all, it appears that we are the center of the universe and that stuff spins around us. It's actually really hard to not think that we're the center. And that's not a pride, it's just the way things look. It's the appearances. Secondly, um, you notice that the stuff in the sky seems to act completely different from the stuff down on the earth. The stuff down on the earth, basically, when it moves of its own accord, moves in a straight line. It moves with increasing speed when it gets closer to things. The velocity changes, and it can be started and stopped by other forces. Things can die and things can decay. Um, there's all kinds of changes that happen down here in the sublunar world, the world under the moon. Whereas the stuff up in the sky seems to act completely different. It seems to always move in a circular motion. It seems to go with a basically uniform velocity. It's basically predictable. And things up there don't seem to die, don't seem to decay, don't seem to undergo all the kinds of changes that stuff down here undergoes. So what do we do with that kind of data? How do we save the appearances? One goal of this time is to find an account, a narrative that just saves the appearances. That's the way Aristotle put it. Well, Aristotle tried to save the appearances. And one thing he theorized is that it's quite simple. The stuff of the sublunar world, the stuff of the world under the moon, is made of something different than the rest of what he called the heavenly bodies. The stuff of the uh, sublunar world is made of the four elements. But the stuff of the heavenly bodies must have been a fifth element that he called ether. And this ether um, basically always went in a circular motion and always... Uh, Never uh, changed. It never, the stuff up there never seemed to change, never uh, underwent other kinds of changes except changing their place, motion. The, um, what this meant to him also is that those things must have caused all the changes in the sublunar world. It was sort of like the outer sphere moved, which moved the next sphere down, which moved the next sphere down, and they were all spheres. Um, and that ultimately changed the way things were on Earth below, which is why astrology was so popular. The heavenly bodies had an impact on the things down here. Um, we should also note that when it came to the sublunar world, Aristotle also tried to save the appearances by saying that things fall at different rates down here, at different velocities, um, which seems to be true. When you drop a feather, it doesn't fall as fast as a rock. So his basic supposition was that, a good theory is that heavier things desire their central place stronger, more strongly, than lighter things. So that's Aristotle's basic cosmology. Now, when it comes to saving the appearances, there was still one more appearance that had to be accounted for. It was true that most of the heavenly bodies seemed to go in a uniform circular motion in the sky. But then there were exceptions, and the exceptions were the planets. The planets were the dancing bodies in the sky. Planet comes from the Greek word for wandering. They were the wandering stars. And we had to figure out why do some of the bright things in the sky seem to dance back and forth. And the guy who would try to save those appearances was Ptolemy. Ptolemy basically had an account that seems very complicated, but it actually did, uh, was an account that worked to save the appearances. He figured that there were epicycles on top of cycles. That's what epicycle means. It means a cycle on a cycle. So as something was going around the earth, it also had its own epicycle, and that would make it appear that they were dancing around in circles in the sky. Now, this is a simplification. His actual theory was very complicated because it involved eccentrics and deference as well as the epicycles. But the main point was that it worked. It seemed to save all the appearances, and most things were predictable in Ptolemy's system, which is why no one wants to change it. If it seems to be right, why would you even change it? Um, another big difference, though, between Ptolemy and today is that today we tend to conflate physics and mathematics. We use math as a powerful tool in almost all the sciences. They're not doing that back then. That's partly because in the old classical liberal education, 
there was a strong division between the mathematical, um, mathematical liberal arts, the quadrivium, and uh, natural philosophy. Natural philosophy was trying to explain how motion worked, whereas mathematics was all about number and surface and the volume and things like that. Even within mathematics, there was a strong division between the arithmetical side and the geometrical side. Arithmetic was seen as purely about discrete number. Geometry was about continuous quantity. And within geometry, there was pure geometry, and then there was astronomy. Now, what's the point here? Um, is that astronomy belonged in geometry and math, which meant that it had nothing to do with the world of motion. The world of motion is the world below the moon. That meant that there was one account for why the heavenly bodies worked that was basically mathematical, and there was another account for all the stuff that happened on Earth. They're not going to meet in the middle. And, we're going to see later, this is also important, geometry and arithmetic were also seen as completely separate. This is something that is all going to go away during the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, but we have to understand it first. Now, when do things start to change? It starts to change with Nicholas Copernicus, a Polish deacon who basically thought there might be a simpler way to explain the dancing of the planets. If you actually put the sun in the center, as you see right here, and have the earth spin around the sun, and then watch the planets as the, um, as the earth also goes around, then if you watch Mars from Earth's point of view, as you see in this particular uh, animation, it will look like Mars is dancing in the sky. Over here you see, see um, the point of view of what Mars looks like from an Earth observer, and you'll see that it dances back and forth as I begin the animation again here. You'll see that it dances back and forth right there. So this was a really powerful theory. There's still, though, Copernicus is given a lot of credit for first bringing back the idea that the sun might be the center. Um, it was bringing back, I say, because it was proposed by the Greeks, by Aristarchus of Samos. But there actually are a lot of theory problems with this theory still, and the main problem being that it actually ended up being, when he did all the, the work, more complicated than Ptolemy's system. In Ptolemy's system, at least, you only have epicycles on cycles, but some of Copernicus's models had double epicycles. For example, right here, around the sun, and then that's on an epicycle, and you have Mercury itself on an epicycle, so Mercury's doing a crazy dance back and forth, back and forth, based on two epicycles at an end of a false uh, linear projection. You see the same thing here with Saturn, and it ended up being more complicated. So the other problem with Copernicus is that the problem of stellar parallax. The argument of stellar par parallax was this. If the Earth was actually going around the Sun, as you see right here, then when someone looked at a nearby star and looked at it against the background of other stars, then if Earth is moving, we should see it shift back and forth like you see here in this animation. I'll play the animation again here and you'll see what I mean. We would see, Earth would, from its different point of view, would see that star shift across a background. Now we don't see that. We don't see the stars shift across the background. And that meant only two things. One, it meant that really Earth is stationary. Maybe this background doesn't change because Earth is not really moving. That's one option. That would have to put Earth in the center. Or the other option was maybe the, the only way you could account for this is if the stars were so, so, so far away that they didn't make, it didn't make a difference. But that meant you would have to presume that the universe was really, 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 really big bigger than anybody thought it was. So big that even a lot of people actually thought, you know what, let's just stick with geocentric because the universe can't be that big. Now, as you all know, now we know the Earth does move and it turns out the universe is really, really big. Not even Galileo is willing to admit the universe is that big. So the problem of the stellar parallax always remained. And a final problem, as I mentioned before, with um, Copernicus's pro solution was that yeah, once we got more data, we realized that Mars was off. Tycho Brahe considered the, continued the work of the astronomers. He was a very wealthy Danish man that, at the request of the King of Denmark, started to uh, observe the stars. You see him right here in his uh, observatory, uh, trying to just uh, chart the pattern of the skies. Very eccentric individual. His nose is actually fake. He had a brass nose. And uh, he also had a pet moose that liked to get drunk a lot. Um, but besides that, he was mainly a big deal because he gathered data. Now, at the end of his life... 
After working for Denmark for a while, he eventually moved to Prague to work for Rudolf von Habsburg, whom you met before. He's the guy who did the Letter of Majesty. And when he went to work for Rudolf von Habsburg in Prague, he met another, uh, the German Johannes Kepler. Now, when Tycho Brahe died, Johannes Kepler continued his work, and Johannes Kepler kept working, and he still kept noticing that Mars was not in the right place where it was supposed to be on either the Ptolemaic model or on Copernican model. So one thing he began to think of is maybe the solution was elliptical orbits. Um, basically, Kepler said that what we have here is not circles and not the same velocity, but we have the planets going around the sun in elliptical orbits, sweeping out equal areas in equal times. And what does equal area equal time mean? It basically means that as the planet is farther away from the sun, it goes more slowly, but as it comes closer to the sun, it goes more quickly. And this was revolutionary because it would say that perfect circles were not what we were observing in the sky. It would also presume that we don't see a uniform velocity, it just seems to be a uniform velocity. And of course, it did also save heliocentrism. So one thing you're noticing right away is that we often just think it was simply two models, Earth center, Sun center. But no, there were actually several models, Ptolemaic, Copernican, Keplerian, Tycho had his own model, Tychonian. Um, and of course, the most famous of all would be the Galilean model. Um, it would be famous, although false, as you'll see in a second. Why do we know, how did Galileo get involved? Because Kepler sent a personal copy of his book on the motion of Mars to Galileo.